We are resuming our studies this evening in John's Gospel. We have been doing a series of studies and hope to be doing so for several weeks yet to come. And this evening we are going to look again at the figure of this man, John the Baptist. I say again because a couple of Sundays ago we looked at him already. Because he's referred to in the part of this first chapter which is called the prologue in the first 18 verses. And we saw, if you cast your eye back to verses 6 through to 8, three things about this man John. We saw, first of all, that he was a man who was sent from God. Secondly, we saw that he was a man who came to bear witness to Christ, the true light that was coming into the world. And thirdly, we saw that he saw himself and indeed was an instrument through whom men were to come to believe. And as we looked at these verses of testimony to John, we saw them as hallmarks of a man who is a true servant of Christ. And tonight it's as if these aspects again are enlarged. And we're brought back again to this man of God, and we see how in response to two leading questions, he gives another testimony. That first question is in verse 19. Who are you? Who are you? And the second question you find in verses 24 and 25, which is virtually, what are you doing as a servant? And in these two responses, John gives, first of all, a testimony about himself, which you find from verses 19 through to 23. And then he gives us a testimony to Jesus from verses 24 to 34. And it's on those two testimonies that I want us to focus our thinking this evening. The testimony that he gives about himself, and then the testimony that he gives to the Lord Jesus. First of all, then, the testimony that he gives about himself. And the first thing that you need to say is that it's clearly not a spontaneous testimony given to impress. John wasn't the kind of person who was in the business of selling himself or making a poppy show of himself. Rather, you discover it was a reluctant testimony squeezed out of him by those who put pressure on him to tell them who he was. Look at verse 19 through 21. Now this was John's testimony when the Jews of Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He didn't fail to confess, but confessed freely, I am not the Christ. They asked him then, who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Gave them short shrift. Hardly a top-selling autobiography. Hardly a good potboiler for the evangelical bookshelves, would it be? And it's only after he's given this triple negative response that he meets a desperate question from them. Look, we've got to go back and tell people who you are. Please tell us who are you? Finally, in verse 22, he gives them his positive answer. And even when he gives them that answer, he carefully phrases it in the words of the prophet Isaiah. And he says, I am the voice of one calling in the desert. Make straight the way for the Lord. The source of the questions was from a group of people referred to as the Jews of Jerusalem in verse 19. These are the ones who sent this deputation. You'll discover in John's Gospel that over 70 times you meet this phrase, the Jews. And the connotation that is attached to that is always sinister. Because it is speaking of those who set themselves in opposition to God and in opposition to the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what we are discovering here right at the outset is that that opposition was in the hearts of the children of Israel even before Christ had begun his public ministry. You know how that John in the prologue had set down the fact that Jesus came unto his own, but his own did not receive him. 
And what we realize here from before the time of Jesus' public ministry is that that opposition arose because these men from the very outset had their hearts closed to the working of God. They were straight-jacketed in their rigid orthodoxy, comfortable with the status quo and uncomfortable with anything that did not conform to it. And if John was not in the business of selling himself, he was certainly not in the business of conforming. And that is one of the reasons why you notice the Jews actually sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. Because John was a priest. Now that may surprise you. We don't think of John the Baptist as a priest, do we? That's because he didn't conform to the typical picture of a priest. But he was a priest because he was the son of a priest. You remember how that his father Zechariah was going about his priestly duties when the angel appeared to him and talked and told him of the birth of the coming John. If a man was not a descendant of Aaron, he couldn't be a priest. But if a man was a descendant of Aaron, he was automatically a priest. And John was not the kind of priest that these priests wanted to have around. He didn't wear priestly robes. He wore camel's hair tied with a leather belt. He didn't fit the image. He didn't eat normal food. Matthew says he ate locusts and wild honey. Probably healthy, but certainly unconventional. And his simple lifestyle showed up the self-indulgence of his colleagues. And what's more, his preaching was offensive, especially to the priests and the Levites. You remember how in Matthew it says that when he saw the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming to him, he said, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Not exactly out of the Dale Carnegie textbook of how to win friends and influence people. And then his baptizing was a new thing. His methodology was rather unconventional, to say the least, and even in the eyes of the priests and the Levites, somewhat theologically suspect. And these old wineskins couldn't take the new wine that John was dispensing. Well, the people of God have never been noted for their readiness to, to accept anything new and unconventional. And this is the kind of situation that you have here. And we need to look at these three questions from the heresy hunters. And from his reply in verse 20, as you look at it, you realize that they must have started by asking him, was he the Messiah or did he think that he was the Messiah? That we learn from his response. He says, he did not fail to confess, but confessed freely, I am not the Christ. Now it's interesting that when you turn over into the Acts in chapter 19, you'll discover that when Paul went to Ephesus, he discovered that there at Ephesus there was a hint of the fact that perhaps some of his hearers had got the wrong end of the stick. And indeed they thought perhaps that he was the Messiah. They were disciples of John whom Luke says knew nothing of the Holy Spirit. Church history actually records that even into the third century, there were a group of disciples of John whom the historians say actually went about and preached that John was the Messiah. Well, John would have been horrified. He did everything that he could to deny such thinking. The language here is, is absolutely emphatic. He did not fail to confess, but confessed freely, I am not the Christ. Now, as I read that, I wondered if there isn't a warning here. The people don't always hear straight. And there's a kind of blind adulation that is sometimes given to the man who ministers that fails to give critical attention to the message that's being ministered. Perhaps it's a common human failing. Has it ever struck you how a whole nation... The German nation could have been so swayed by Hitler. 
that it's not just something that happens in the secular realm. It happens too in the Christian realm. I remember reading somewhere that in the days when Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones was a great and greatly used preacher, the doctor as he was called, there was a certain criticism leveled at some of the members of his congregation who seemed somewhat extreme in some of their views. And someone said, are those the views of the doctor? The doctor, in fact, was very balanced in that particular area. And his comment and response was that the preacher's emphasis can sometimes be the hearer's excess. But you know, it's not just a phenomenon of the 60s and the 50s. There are men in some circles today who are claiming to be prophets, claiming to actually have an authority as they give a word of prophecy which they dare to put on a level with the authority of Scripture. And there are some who believe them. And we need to beware of that. Who would dare put his word on a level with the authority of Scripture? Well, in this case, the, hearer's em the preacher's emphasis rather was very clear. He did not fail to confess, but confessed freely, I am not the Christ. And if John was ever tempted to accept credit or a claim to himself, he steadfastly refused to give it parking space. Then secondly, the question comes to him in verse 24, then 21, then who are you? Are you Elijah? Now, why did they ask that? Well, you will probably know that back in 2 Kings 2, Elijah's departure from earth was unconventional to say the least. He did not die a natural death. He was caught up in a whirlwind. When the horses and chariots of fire appeared, it was a remarkable departure for a remarkable prophet. Added to that, the Jews knew that right at the end of the Old Testament canon, back in the book of Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament, there was a particular prophecy which spoke about the coming of Elijah. Chapter 4 of Malachi and verse 5 says, See, I will send you the prophet Elijah before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers or else I will come and strike the land with a curse. That's the last prophecy with which the Old Testament and the prophetic canon closed. And for 430 years, the prophetic voice had been silent. And suddenly that voice is heard again in John. And the natural deduction is, is this the Elijah who is coming before the day of the Lord? Are you Elijah? If you look into Luke's Gospel in chapter 1 and verse 17, You'll find that when the angel of the Lord came and spoke to Zechariah, he actually said, verse 16, saying that this child will be filled from the, with the Holy Spirit from birth. Many of the people of Israel will he bring back to the Lord their God, verse 17, and he will go before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous and make ready a people prepared for the Lord. A direct application of that prophecy from Malachi. And Jesus actually confirmed that prophecy as applying to John in Matthew 11 and 14. He says he is the Elijah who was to come. Or look again at Matthew 17, verses 10 to 13. The disciples asked Jesus, Why then do the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? Jesus replied, To be sure, Elijah comes and will restore all things. But I tell you, Elijah has already come, and they did not recognize him, but have done to him everything they wished. In the same way the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he was talking to them about John the Baptist. Now, if that is true, 
And hath Jesus confirmed that prophetic word with respect to John, that he had come in the power and the spirit of Elijah? Why did John then say, no, I'm not? And surely the answer is that Jews believed that since Elijah had not died, that he would come back physically to announce the last days. And John knew that he was not that physical Elijah. According to the literal and wooden ideas of contemporary Israeli interpretation. It was in the sense that he was fulfillment of the prophecy in all its spiritual meaning that Jesus endorsed that he was the fulfillment of the prophetic word. And perhaps there's need again there for a word of caution. That we do not interpret prophecy just in literal and physical ways. Then thirdly, they ask him, are you the prophet? Which prophet? That's a reference that takes you right back to the time of Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 18. If you turn to that passage for a second. Because deep buried in the past and in all the things that they had inherited from Moses, there was this prophecy that a prophet would come. Chapter 18 of Deuteronomy and verse 15. The Lord your God, says Moses, will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own brothers. You must listen to him. For this is what you asked of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly. And it goes on to speak about prophets in the plural. Verse 19, if anyone does not listen to my word that the prophet speaks in my name, I myself will call him to account. But then in verse 20, it speaks about another prophet. But a prophet who presumes to speak in my name anything I have not commanded him to say, or a prophet who speaks in the name of other goods, must be put to death. You may say to yourselves, how can we know when a message has not been spoken by the Lord, if what the prophet proclaims in the name of the Lord does not take place or come true? That is a message that the Lord has not spoken. That prophet has spoken presumptuously. Do not be afraid of him. Now that passage refers to the coming of the prophet, a prophet, specific. But it also refers to prophets and is a collective reference to the prophets of whom our Lord is the ultimate prophet. Jesus refers to this passage in John 5, 46, when he says, if you had believed Moses, you would have believed what Moses wrote about me. And you go on through John's gospel and the people as they listen to Jesus say, surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Peter's message in Solomon's porch as he preaches in Acts chapter 3 confirms the very prophecies of Deuteronomy and applies them to Jesus. And Stephen in his defense links that very scripture again with the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And John knew that Moses' prophecy about the coming of prophets and the ultimate prophet that was to come referred to the one who was prophet, priest and king. And John also knew that it was for that prophet that he had been sent to prepare the way. But he was not that prophet. So he was not the Christ. He was not Elijah. Nor was he the prophet. It's interesting, isn't it, to watch the way in which John gives his testimony. He gets shorter and shorter. First of all, he confesses freely, I'm not the Christ. And then when they ask him if he's Elijah, he says, I am not. And when they ask him if he's the prophet, he just says, no. Perhaps that's a good rule for those who are asked to give testimonies. And finally, when they got exasperated, what do you say about yourself? He says, I am the voice. But the voice of one calling in the desert, make straight the way for the Lord. You know, when they put up the fourth road bridge, I believe that they had a problem, particularly on the north side. The problem was how were you to get a road down to the water's edge where that bridge came? There was so much rock in the way. And they had to blast that rock out of the way in order to make a straight path for the road. And there is a sense in which John and all who seek to preach the gospel are in that kind of ministry, blasting away the rock as it were, the hard rock of man's heart, to make a way for God to reach. And of that kind of ministry and of that man, John, God said, 
Jesus said, among men born of women there has not arisen anyone greater than John the Baptist. And yet the characteristic that emerges about this man's greatness was his humility and his consistent testimony to the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter said, all of you, clothe yourselves with humility, because God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. In other words, a proud man will find that he has God as his adversary. And as every one of us in one day must stand and give account before the judgment seat of Christ, it would be an awesome thing, would it not, to find that we were not clothed with that humility. Because it is the apron of humility around which God flings the robe of Christ's righteousness. And it is that robe, and that robe alone, that we must wear before the judgment seat of Christ. Someone has said we can't all have sparkling talents. We can't all find ourselves in the public eye. But there is nothing to stop any one of us wearing the apron of humility. All John would ever say of himself was, I am a voice, a bearer of a message, crying in the wilderness. In his case, that was literally true. But it was also figuratively true as he saw the state of the nation in spiritual barrenness and bankruptcy. He cried in the wilderness and desolation of that spiritual wasteland. And his message was to make a straight way for the Lord, to prepare a highway for God to reach into that spiritual wilderness, to find the heart of man and to turn the hearts of men to God. John was faithful to that ministry. And if when he had proclaimed that mission message, men did not turn, then the responsibility lay fair and square on their shoulders. Because John was a man who never put himself in the way of his message. That then about John's testimony to himself. Secondly, John's testimony to Jesus, and some of you may be relieved to know that we have no third point tonight. Somebody said that all sermons ought to have three points, and there was a preacher who once preached on what Moses did, what Moses said, and the woman of Samaria, because he couldn't think of his third point. Well, I assure you there's no woman of Samaria tonight. John's testimony to Jesus arises out of their second major question that they bring to him in verse 24. Now some of the Pharisees who had been sent questioned him. Questioned him, Why then do you baptize if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? Now it's significant here that John, in writing his gospel, makes mention of the fact that it was the Pharisees amongst the priests and the Levites who asked that question. You know that there were the two parties, the Sadducean party, which was in the majority in the Sanhedrin, somewhat liberal in their lacking of theology. They didn't believe in the resurrection, the supernatural. They didn't believe in miracles or angels or spirits. And then there was the party of the Pharisees, whom some have said were perhaps the evangelicals of the day. I don't think that's terribly fair. But at least it was true that they sought to be faithful to the truth of God's word, and they were very concerned for orthodoxy. And I think that perhaps the Pharisees were concerned that if John did not claim to be the Messiah, then how could he be baptizing his fellow Israelites? What authority did he have? for that. And it was a problem for them, both as to the subjects who were receiving that baptism, as well as the manner in which the baptism was being administrated. These things are not new. Baptism in their tradition was something that they administered, not to the children of Israel, but to those who came into the community of Israel, the proselytes and their children, Gentiles who were converts to the faith. 
So why then was John administering baptism to those whom they considered to be already within the company of the elect? It was highly unorthodox and theologically suspect. So they asked him, if you're not the Christ, if you're not Elijah, if you're not the prophet, why then are you baptizing these people? Secondly, I believe that the administration of that rite of baptism to the covenant people of God in the Old Testament was surely the sole prerogative of the Christ, the Messiah. It says in Isaiah 52 about the servant, my servant or the servant of the Lord will sprinkle many nations. And in that classic passage in Ezekiel 36 which speaks about baptism, and the work of grace and regeneration in the heart. It is God who says in Ezekiel 36 and verse 25, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone. I will give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit in you. I will move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. It's God himself who administers that baptism. And in Zechariah 13.1, speaking of the days of the new covenant, it says, In that day a fountain shall be opened to the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and impurity. And what these men knew as they knew their Bible and their scriptures was that it was the Lord's prerogative to baptize, not man. And so they questioned to him, if you are not the Messiah, why then are you baptizing? Do you see John's reply in verse 26? Very significant. I, he said, baptize with water. But among you stands one you do not know. Verse 31. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed in Israel. Then John gave this testimony, I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. I would not have known him except that the one who sent me to baptize with water told me the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is he who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. What John is saying is, you know, you're quite right to ask me why I baptize if I am not the Messiah. It's perfectly true. It is only God who can administer that baptism. It is only his Messiah who has the right to baptize and to cleanse. And what I do is but the symbol and the sign which points to another. I, and in the Greek it's emphatic, I baptize with water. But among you stands one you do not know. And I'm not even worthy to unloose his sandals. And he is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. Do you see what John is doing as a servant of the Lord? I'm not out, he says, to draw men to myself. I am not baptizing them to become my disciples. I'm not bringing them into my party. I'm not wanting men to follow me. I am seeking to bring men and women to the one who stands among you. If only you would have eyes to see him. He is the one who is before me. He is the one who is after me. He is the one who is above me so much so that I'm not worthy to be his lowest slave. And it is for him and to him that I would point you. I baptize the body with water. But he is the one who baptizes the heart with the Holy Spirit. I can only administer the sign. He alone it is that administers what that sign stands for. 
that inner cleansing and renewal of the heart by the Holy Spirit of God. I can only use a symbol or a picture which is the external symbol of water. But he is the one that can bring everything that that water of cleansing symbolizes. He can bring a new heart by the baptism of the Holy Spirit. For he will baptize with that blessed Holy Spirit in the promise and the spirit of Ezekiel 36. He it is and he alone who will give you a new heart. He it is who will put a new spirit within you. He it is who will take away your heart of stone. He it is who will give you a heart of flesh in exchange and make you sensitive where once you had become callous. He it is who will give you his Holy Spirit and the power to live a life for God. He it is who will move you to follow my decrees. He it is who will enable you to keep my word. He it is who will cause you to live in the land of promise. And he it is who will make you his own people. And he it is who will be your very own God, for he will save you from your sins. You see, there's a very fundamental and important message here about baptism. Water baptism may be a sign associated with our acceptance into the visible church. But it is by the baptism of the Holy Spirit that you and I are accepted into Christ. As by that Spirit of God we are born again. As we are born from above at our conversion. Listen to these words from J.C. Ryle. It is, he said, a baptism which the great head of the church keeps exclusively in his own hands. It consists of the implanting of grace into the inward man. It is the same thing with the new birth. It is a baptism not of the body but of the heart. It is a baptism which the penitent thief received, though neither dipped nor sprinkled by the hand of man. It is a baptism which Ananias and Sapphira did not receive, though admitted into church communion by apostolic men. Such is the barren wilderness of our hearts, that no man, be he apostle or priest or prophet, and no ordinance, be it ever so precious and holy, and no method, be it ever so popular and acclaimed, can ever change us. Only the radical, overwhelming baptism of the Holy Spirit of God, by which we are born again into the family of God, can do that. No man, not even John the Baptist, himself of whom Jesus said among men born of women there was not a greater not even John the Baptist can give that baptism which is one of the reasons why you and I need to be healthily wary and suspicion, suspicious of any who profess to be able to do so only Jesus can baptize with his Holy Spirit and in this testimony that John gives of the one who comes to baptize with the Holy Spirit, he points to Jesus and in his first public declaration about him he says, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. For it was because he was the sacrifice for our sin sent by his Father God that he saves us from our sin and he's able to transform our hearts. Jesus came into the world to do what you and I can never do for ourselves and what no man can ever do for us. To save us from our sins and to change us from the inside out. To deliver us from both the power and the penalty of our sin. Says John, he takes away the sin of the world. What is Ezekiel's promise about the new birth? 
and the baptism of God's Spirit, I will cleanse you from all your impurities. I will take away your calloused heart. I will give you a new heart and put my Spirit in you. And Jesus, as the Lamb of God, bore in his own body on the tree our sins as he took them away. So that the sins of any man or woman who believes on him and receives him as Savior and surrenders his life and his all to him as Lord, those sins are made as if they had never been committed. Behold the Lamb of God takes away the sin of the world. And he did that that he might give you and me a new heart. He did that that he might put his Holy Spirit within us. He did that that he might move us to keep his word. He did that that we might know that joy inexpressible, full of glory. That's what the baptism of the Spirit is about. And that's why Jesus said to that very religious man, Nicodemus, you must be born again. You must be born of the Spirit. John the Baptist said to those religious men standing there, among you stands one you do not know. He is the one whom to know is life eternal. We don't need to turn to any other man or woman. And this night he stands among us. The question is, do you know him? Let's pray.